Welcome to this next edition in our series of podcasts. The topic of this podcast is motherhood, pandemics and the Olympics. We've got a very special guest for this episode, Encephalitis Society ambassador and all round swimming legend, Rebecca Adlington. Rebecca, <laughs> Rebecca is a four-time Olympic medalist swimmer, making her one of Team GB's most decorated Olympians ever and a former world record holder. She is also, I'm very proud to say, an ambassador with the Encephalitis Society and has been for the last 14 years. Um, as the Olympics have played such a key role in Becky's life, it seemed fitting to invite her uh, to come along, join us for a chat ahead of the Tokyo Olympics, which start on the 23rd of July. So welcome, Becky. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. Thanks for joining us. I know it's a really busy time for you and not just with regard to the Olympics. For those of you that don't know, Becky has recently become a mum for the second time. So how are you and the family? I can see baby there. Yeah, no, we're good. He's four months old now. So um, not getting much sleep, but hey, what parent does? <laughs> so it's fine. Um, and Summer's absolutely great as well. She's absolutely loving being a big sister. I think she genuinely thinks that she is his mum. She's like, mummy, I can do this. I want to do the bottle. I want to do the nappy. I want to push his pram. I'm like, oh my God, you're six. It's like ridiculous, but it's all good. And we're loving it. And just kind of, you just crack on. I think it's easier with your seconds because they just fit into your life. Whereas the first one, everything evolved around summer. Whereas now he's just got to slot into the school runs and whatever we're doing. So it's all good. Oh, that's amazing to hear. You know, it's obviously, you know, it goes without saying it's been a tricky 18 months for people, uh, given the circumstances, you know, with the pandemic and everything. And, and I was curious, you know, was being pregnant during lockdown more difficult um, than um, yeah. your first pregnancy with Summer? Yeah, 100 percent. It was so different. I think the thing is, if you didn't have anything to compare it to, you probably wouldn't have known the difference, whereas obviously I knew the exact difference Andy wasn't my partner wasn't allowed into any of the scans he didn't come to one doctor's appointment with me normally you hear the heartbeat every time and they kind of you get to share those things none of that um a lot of your midwife appointments were done over the phone um there was real anxiety over whether he would even be allowed at the birth and how quickly you'd have to leave luckily it was fine he was able to be there and it all worked out in the end but I've heard some horrific stories and that just not only are you pregnant and dealing with the pandemic and everything else in life, but you're also dealing with the anxiety of, I can't do this on my own. I can't, I want my partner with me. And that you were just anxious the whole way through going, is he going to be there? Because it was just so unknown and every hospital was different. There was so many different rules and regulations on it. So it was just, you just felt uneasy all the time because you were always on your own and you just didn't really know what to expect. Uh, I mean, you don't know what to expect in pregnancy anyway, let alone dealing with a pregnancy and, pan and a pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, no, I well, I can't, you know, I can't imagine uh, like you, um, you know, I've heard um, variations, you know, the fact that, as you say, so many places were doing it differently. There wasn't a set, um, no. a, a set way for a hospital uh, to respond. But I, I guess that kind of brings us to another thing that's been important, which is mental resilience. And that's something that at team you know team encephalitis we've been particularly interested in and uh, during the pandemic and, and tried to work on that kind of emotional resilience in our in our team but you know it goes without saying we've all had highs we've all had lows it's been a really uncertain time do you did you find that your career as as this kind of, you know really high performing um sports person um and the highs and lows that come with that um, do you think that helped in any way, your resilience during the pandemic? Um, not really, because I feel like sports people, we're quite, um, we're quite control freaks in a way. You kind of have to be in control of everything as an athlete because it's your body, you're pushing yourself to the limit, it's your performance, everything is kind of, you have to be in control of it. Some as uh, any athletes kind of like to just feel that they're in control. And I think this, the, the thing in the pandemic is it, everything's been so out of our control. You've, we've not been able to control anything. Um, we've had no say in it. You've got no matter whether you like it, agree with it, don't agree with it, you've had to get on with it. And I think that that's been really, really difficult. I think in some ways, 
I'm very grateful that it taught me to slow down. I feel like some of the lessons I've learned in lockdown, I feel like I'm the type of person that you just go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And especially with kids as well, like you always try to fill your time. Well, we're going to go here to entertain you. And we're going to go here and we're going to go there. Whereas actually the one thing I think the pandemic has taught me is to slow down I don't need to be going here there and everywhere and actually neither does my daughter like the kids are happy being at home they're happy just being and they don't want to just like get in the car again and even now I think I'm really important I think it's made me realize how important it is to slow down it's also made me realize how important friends and family are because that's been the biggest struggle and I always knew how important they were but and even from an athlete's perspective they're your support team but now more than ever I'm like all I want to do is be with my friends and family I'm not even bothered about kind of going on holiday or going to the pub just let me see my friends and family <laughs> oh <laughs> um I you, you know what advice uh, if you if you have any would you give to anybody watching this you know who feels those peaks and troughs but wants to be better at navigating those kinds of feelings um I think a lot of it is self-care as well like I think it's about finding what works for you I've learned over the past couple of years I used to get to the point where I was so busy in the day and then I'd get to an evening, put the kids down to bed and then I'd go, oh, and then all these feelings and emotions would come out in an evening. And just because there was so much, it, that's what gave me anxiety because it was just all flooding in at once and I couldn't manage them because it was just too much at one time. And I found that kind of taking a bit of time throughout the day, taking five minutes to just have my cup of tea in the morning it can be so silly but me taking my cup of tea in the morning just my daughter knows mummy's not playing until she's had her cup of tea like it's just small things like that and even throughout the day making time to just have five minutes that's just me to my lunch or going for a walk or just going outside to process things throughout the day and to process the way you're feeling and to accept them I definitely learned um, through having experienced panic attacks and going through therapy as well to acknowledge all feelings I think you acknowledge if you're feeling tired you wake up and you go oh I feel tired today or oh I feel good today yet you never acknowledge if you feel down or depressed or anxious and actually when I feel panicky I go oh okay I, I just feel a bit panicky here and I just acknowledge it it's just another normal feeling just as all the other feelings are, but I don't think we normalize that. We think it's, we heighten it and make it something worse, which makes you more anxious. And then you go on this whole cycle. And I feel like just as you would say, oh, I'm tired or oh, I feel a bit groggy today. Or why can't we just say, oh, I feel a bit panicky today. I think we just need to normalize all emotions a lot more, not just the, the kind of the box standard ones yeah no well wise words I'm feeling I'm feeling better already I feel like I've had a, <laughs> a session there yeah I think you're right it's about it's about embracing feelings isn't it and not blocking them yeah yeah definitely I think that's really important and especially throughout this time as well whether you're on your own a lot more kind of it's it's been a tough time hasn't it I found the recent lockdown over the winter the hardest really really hard the first one I thought was kind of difficult but this past one has just been horrific just through winter dark dark and just horrible weather it's just dragged it's just yeah I've hated this lockdown <laughs> yeah yeah no agreed I, I think you're right and, and I think it was probably uh, my worst one as well I quite like the winter that wasn't the problem but it just you we're beginning to get this sense of never-endingness as well and and also not being able to see um, family, you know, there was that three day um, uh, window, window over Christmas. And of course, my husband was was at work during that period. So we couldn't see his family during the gap that was given because, yeah. he, you know, anyway. But well, look, look you know, we'll, we'll stay a bit on the topic of, of COVID, but also turning to the Olympics post swimming, you've built up this career as a commentator and you're going to be again covering all the events uh, in the pool um, for the Olympics albeit from I think if I've got it right the BBC's HQ in Salford um, but you know how is Team GB uh, looking this year let's get some insights yeah no really really good um, it's the best swim team I've seen for a very very long time um, if 
things go to plan because I think the thing is we've learned anything can happen anything can change really quickly obviously if one of them even tests positive that can affect the whole team so I think a lot more is heightened this time the risk is so much greater I know they've all been isolating I know there's so many procedures in place no friends and family can be there I know that they've got to fly home as soon as their event is finished they fly home they're not flying home as a team they're not staying out there as a usual Olympic so there is a lot of stuff in place but from the positive side they are in unbelievable shape like they swam and they had their olympic trials and they've had a european championships in the past couple of months and i am so surprised how quick they all swam um we've seen so many people now at the top of the world rankings and it's not just adam pt because a lot of people know adam pt and adam's name yet there's so many other swimmers now there's freya anderson duncan scott the relays are really strong luke greenbank molly renshaw the list goes on and on um and to be honest i feel like we're going to get probably between five and eight medals i think the most we've got was in rio and i think we're going to better that this time Oh, that sounds amazing. Well, I was going to ask you whether there were any swimmers from Team GB um, that we should be looking out for, and you've just reeled off some names there. <laughs> um, are there any really strong people you think from other countries um, that that uh, we should keep our eye on as well? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to judge, isn't it? Because that's the thing that is this unknown, because we don't know what other countries, what their preparation has been. Our pools for elite people um, were only shut the first lockdown so they have been able to train throughout the past couple of lockdowns because elite has had a, a pass or whatever they've been able to just train um, so obviously we don't know how other countries have done obviously America and Australia they're such strong nations especially in the pool you've got people like a Katie Ledecky, who is just so dominant. You've got Caleb Dressel from uh, America as well. It's some of the other countries like France, like Spain, kind of, we don't know how they're going to fare. Um, so it's going to be a really interesting games because you used to see in shocks. I mean, nobody expected me to go to Beijing and win two gold medals. Nobody even knew who I was. So I think you've always got to expect the unexpected at the Olympics and people always come out the woodwork. But I feel like this time there's going to be even more shocks and surprises. Um, but because of we're in this pandemic and the thing is, you could have gone all this time, waited five years, and it could be so easily that you've got to isolate or you've got a test, a positive test once you get out there, which is going to be so heartbreaking because it is going to happen. Um, it's unrealistic to think that not one athlete is going to test or has to isolate. So it's going to be, there's definitely going to be some upsets and some shocks and um, just hopefully it's not from the rich team. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, you mentioned, um, you know, that that five years now, because the, obviously the Olympics have been delayed by a year. Um, do, do you think that that will have an impact on the athletes? I, I, I was always led to believe, and, and I could be wrong, but I was always led to believe that athletes operate in four year cycles so that they can peak for the Olympics. So what's the implication of this being a year later? Yeah, no, you're 100% right. We always run in four year blocks. Um, so it's been really difficult. And I don't even just think physically it's difficult. I think mentally, it's really difficult. They were all ready to go last year. Everything had built up to have this massive low of it taken away from you to now being built back up again. And that emotional kind of mental drain, it, is, it makes me feel a bit drained, let alone as an athlete, it's like trying to stay at the top of their game and kind of do that and I think we've we've seen a difference because the younger athletes they've kind of really used this opportunity because last year they were slightly too young yet they've really come through now and they've gone yes I've had this extra year I'm a year older and I've made the team and I've got I'm underway now but then on the flip side of that you've got the old ones that were kind of clinging on to last year that have now got to stretch a year so I think it's just been different for different people um so I think there's going to be a real mix and for somebody like an Adam Peaty who's staying at the top of his game it, it is going to be hard because they were all ready to go last year but at the same time I think they're just so excited to have an Olympics because for an, for us athletes it's every four years you have to wait so long to become an Olympian and to get that opportunity to achieve the biggest thing ever that I just think they're like just give it to me they're so hungry for that success they're so like 
driven and motivated now more than ever because it's like in sight now and I think there's been so much um and an and is it going to happen is it going to go ahead what's it going to look like whereas now I feel like we're in a pretty comfortable place that it's going to happen now I think it's going to be pretty shocking if it doesn't happen and go ahead now because I mean the British team are flying out in a couple of days so hopefully yeah um, it'll, it'll all be fine <laughs> oh well um absolutely um, look, as someone who um, benefited, I, I suppose, from the, the noise and enthusiasm of Team GB supporters during the Olympics, do, do you think that a lack of crowd is going to impact on the team in any way? Um, I think it's definitely going to be difficult, um, especially because at Olympics, my fav- some of my favourite memories are because my mum and dad were there. And because my my mum and dad travelled everywhere with me and you share that with them, like people don't realise I openly will say my medals are just as much my parents as they are mine yes I might have done the swimming but they're the ones that have been your everything they have been your taxi driver your funding your support my mum has been my physio my nutritionist my absolute everything and I think to not share that with your loved ones is really difficult um but I think at the same time they have had a couple of competitions now with no spectators um so it's not like this is the very first opportunity they've had to race with no crowd they've been doing that for last year and this year so I I think they are getting better at that and the good thing with the Olympics more than some of the past competitions is they know it's televised so they know that all their friends and family are going to be shoved in somebody's front room watching this glued to the telly at 2am because that's when the swimming finals are and just going to be absolutely buzzing for them so they know that so I think that will spur them on even though they won't be able to hear it and it won't be able to be there they will have like that vision in their heads of just people glued to their tv and know that they are supporting them 100 percent. so um but i think it does give you an edge i think it'll be on i think it wouldn't be fair to say that the crowd doesn't just lift you one percent because it does um so it might just be the difference between somebody breaking a world record or somebody just not so uh time will tell i guess well Okay, well, you know, let me take you back anyway to 2008. Um, I think it was felt generally that maybe you had an outside chance of a a medal um, um, and probably not winning two golds. Um, You became our golden girl, um, you know, with victory in the 400 and the 800 metre freestyles. You know, tell us a little bit about that. You know, it must have been like a fairy tale for you. Oh gosh, it was like, I was even surprised to go just this girl from Mansfield who kind of never expected anything to even go to an Olympics was just like, oh my God, I've I, nobody from Mansfield has ever done anything <laughs> like got made it to the Olympics. I kind of felt like that was just unbelievable to then kind of come away with two gold medals was just honestly so much higher than I even thought possible I remember after the 400 phoning my mum and dad and they were like why didn't you tell us I was like I didn't know (laughs) because my mum and dad didn't come out for the 400 because that was kind of not really my event they were like look that's just your warm-up we'll come out for the eight not the four just because it was so expensive as well um but yeah they were thoroughly disappointed to to not see that event but obviously I didn't know at my target was to make the final so it was just absolutely incredible and that's the thing at olympics things unexpected things happen which is just amazing and and for the 800 as well i never ever thought it was possible to break that world record ever i just thought it was 19 years old i didn't even entertain i couldn't have even told you what the exact old world record was because i wouldn't even look at it i wouldn't even let it come into my realm of thinking because I was like there's just no chance there's no point in looking at it I knew it was 816 but I can't tell you 816 point I don't know what the point was at the end because I just didn't factor it in so yeah that's how far I thought it was from what I could do um so yeah it was just unbelievable life-changing just absolutely just all that hard work paying off as well because that's the thing you see you watch the olympics but people forget that that's every 5 a.m start every morning rain or shine scraping the ice off your windscreen sat in the changing rooms crying because you're in so much pain and can't drive home it's like all the blood sweat and tears that people don't see when they watch the olympics but that's what all goes into it so it means so much to you when it happens 
Yeah, well, you did win. Well, you did win the gold in the eight hundred and get get the world record, as you said. But you know, and I'm get I get chills when I think about it now. You did do that in front of mum and dad. They had arrived, and there was that moment, wasn't there, when you when you finished? And uh, well, you you tell us all of a sudden. Do you, do you did you suddenly realize that that you'd you'd got the gold and the world record and then then the cameraman did something incredible I Tell know us about it, that. it was literally like a movie moment that's the only way to describe it because I kind of knew I had won the race unless there was somebody in an outside lane I couldn't see I kind of knew I had won so I touched the wall and the scoreboards in Beijing was all the way down the other end so you had to really squint to see it because it was so far away it was a good 80 meters away it wasn't close so there's me like squinting going yeah I've won I could see number one near my name and then I saw WR flash up and I did have the blonde moment going what's WR get off the screen I want to know what time I've done and obviously then realized I broke the world record and I just couldn't I thought the timing system was wrong I was like 8 14 I was like what I just I totally I, I was blown away and then I tried to find my mum and dad but there's 17,000 people in in the swimming pool and it's absolutely impossible and my parents were involved in some ticket fraud as well so I didn't know where they were sat because somebody gave them tickets in the end didn't know where they were sat I was trying to look for them like a needle in a haystack and the cameraman somehow finds my mum and dad they kept flashed upon the big screen so all I did was look at the screen and there's my mum and dad crying their eyes out, like cheering. It was such a lovely moment because I just couldn't see them. So even though I wasn't looking at them, I was looking at them through the screen. And then I turned around and saw my coach and saw my teammates. And it was just such a perfect sequence of events, like gold, world record, my mum and dad, my coach and teammates. And it was just it was just like a movie reel. It was almost like it was a trailer. It was like it was too good. It was just yeah, my favourite moment from any Olympics was that moment. And I still remember it so clearly. And I'm pretty sure they only found my mum and dad because they had British flags. And they probably just thought these two are cheering for British. Let's just go on them. They probably didn't know it was my mum and dad, but it was just lovely that it was my mum and dad. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, it is, it is one of those really special moments. Just it will be a memory, you know, you know, for the rest of your life and also for, for, you know, for many of us who've seen it, you know, subsequent times since then and know you. Um, you know, what, what's it like to put, for those of us that will never know, what's it like to put or have a, a, a gold medal put around your neck? You know, um, what's that feeling? It's always one of those that you always kind of like, you always say you'd do something crazy, like, God, if I won the lottery, I'd do this. Or God, if I won an Olympic med lab, like run around naked. And then it actually happens. And you think none of those like random things that you want to do. But it's like it, it was just it's almost like it wasn't real. It's almost like you're having an out of body experience because you stand behind the podium. You hear your name. You stand up on this block and it doesn't sink in at that very moment what is happening. It's almost, it's weird because you're just, you finish, you've been dragged from pillar to post, you've then been dragged around to the podium that you don't have a moment until you're stood behind that block to actually just go, what just happened? And that's the first moment when you stand behind the podium that you just get to breathe, that you get to just be, think for the first time since you finish your race, you get a, mo a moment because somebody's not talking to you or whatever, that you're just silent to just process it a little bit. And it's just absolutely mad. And then you just, you're in pain because you, you've just pushed your body to the limit. So you're like, God, my legs are on fire. <laughs> you just, I need a glass of water or something because you're feeling all of those things. But then you think back to all the 5 a.m. starts. Then you, everything flashes before you and you're just like, all that hard work has paid off. And you don't know whether to cry, to smile, to just burst into song. You feel every emotion. You feel relief as well. A lot of relief that you go, oh God, that was all worth it. Oh God, it paid off. Um, you feel like a weight has lifted off your shoulders and you're just, you're so happy and you just, it's just like, yeah, it's so hard to explain because it's just everything that you've put into it. Um, and the fact that you get to share it with you. To, uh, one of my favourite things was when the national anthem happened. So we never normally hear the British national <laughs> anthem. And I just, I can remember laughing so much because the team singing was atrocious. And it was just like, 
God save! And everyone just shouts it. Whenever you sing the national anthem, you don't sing it nicely, do you? You just scream it and you're like, yeah. And it's just, it's hilarious because you just like everyone's screaming and cheering and just going mental. And it's just, yeah, it's lovely. So from that moment, would it be right to say then that your life was forever changed? Oh, massively. I remember going back to my coach and my coach said, my, his exact words were, I want to be the first person that says, you're double Olympic champion, your life's going to change. And I laughed in his face. I was like, don't be so stupid as if, just because I wasn't retiring, I was, I knew I was carrying on, etc. So I kind of thought, what is going to change? At the end of the day, I'm going to go back to the same swimming club, get up at 5am and go training again. I kind of just didn't see what was going to change. It's not like you win a million pounds with a gold medal. You don't win any money when you get a gold medal. So it's not like money was going to change anything either. So I was just like, what's going to change? And then as soon as we, we landed home from Beijing, because we we're in this little bubble over there, I quickly realized, I was like, why does everyone want to talk to me? And why is everyone wanting a photo with me? And how do you know me? How do you know my name? I don't know who you are. We've not met. And it, it's bizarre. And then you've been asked to go to strictly come dancing to sit in the crowd and you're asking to go on a, a tv show or to, talk to pierce morgan on telly and you're like why what have i done <laughs> it's bizarre it is absolutely bizarre and it's one of those that i'm so lucky because everyone is so lovely people everyone that you meet um is just like oh i used to grow up in mansfield oh i used to do this or talk to you because you just normal it's not like you're an actor try or playing a baddie or anything like that so it is really nice and everyone's been really friendly and it's just yeah it has been an amazing opportunity but a weird one <laughs> well I I was one of those people um who pursued you and I, I I remember you know you'd come back from Beijing um we were opening the post at Encephalitis HQ and 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 there we were we'd been sent a a check uh, from this cooking program and um, said it was sent on behalf of, of you uh, and your mum who'd been on this this cookery program and we were scratching our heads just going why would they want to send us a check you know on behalf of Rebecca Adlington of course I googled it quickly and and found your mum talking about your sister a video of your mum talking about your sister and then everything made sense and and you know I'll be I'll be forever grateful that I, I did reach out to, to you and I remember we had lunch in uh, I think it was Nottingham actually um, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, right and um, so you know we're forever grateful for that but but for people that, that don't know the background um, you know you agreed to become an ambassador you know with the encephalitis society which was you know that was our gold medal for us you know we we never thought that you'd say yes so you know we've always been super grateful but but for people that don't know do you, do you just want to say a few words about what your connection with encephalitis is yeah so my Sister Laura, my little sister, um, got encephalitis in 2005. Yeah, it was a couple of years before Beijing. And it was something that completely rocked just any, as anyone knows, with encephalitis, just completely rocks your life, your family's life, everything else. We did the pretty much, I think it's probably a normal reaction going, what is encephalitis? I think most people would have that reaction. Um, I was at the time um so I had no clue and my sister was in intensive care and it was one of those we got told oh it's meningitis oh it's this your sister's not going to make it say bye to her and and all this happened um and luckily she did recover from it a doctor did correctly diagnose that it was encephalitis which we are so grateful for as a family as I know it often gets misdiagnosed so we're very grateful it did and then my mum literally put her head in books she was like what is this I need to find out more and as mums do just do every research under the sun and she did um, and it's one of those that we kind of didn't have a clue about it my sister didn't even when she it obviously took many many weeks for her to come around and kind of process what was happening to her she didn't have a clue at first but then it was kind of something that she's got to manage and she's got to deal with. So it was one of those that I, from working with you guys, just know how much good you do, whether it's from a raising awareness to your members, to families, to support to, across the board. Um, and I think it's one of those, it's been so lovely to, for me to meet other members, whether they're people that have been affected by it themselves or meeting people that like me, it was a family member because 
yes, it's horrible for the person it's happening. I totally appreciate from my sister's perspective. She's really struggled with it over the years um, and kind of doesn't know, well, is that because of that or is that because that's the way I am? And it's a really fighting kind of battle with her whereas for a family member you're seeing your loved one go through something that's really hard as well um so it's been nice that people you kind of have this little community and this little bubble of people and you just get to talk to them and and everything and even my mom I think has ended up doing stuff for you guys as well she loves all of that sort of stuff my mom wants to get involved all the time ask my dad to talk and he'll run a mile but my mom she's like yeah I'll do it and I'm up for this and I think it's really nice that kind of the whole family wants to get behind it. It's still something my sister struggles with um, to massively get involved with, but I understand that it's different for her because it happened to her. Whereas for the rest of us, and she always wants to raise money. She's done loads of stuff raising money for you guys as, as well and always wants to kind of raise awareness where possible in her own little way. Yeah, no, well, it's great having you. you. Like you say, we didn't we didn't just get Becky Adlington as an ambassador. You know, we got the whole Adlington family. So, yeah. you know, got my mum for life. <laughs> we got extra. Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, yeah. And let's hope that soon we can get back to some of these in-person events, because I know uh, everybody, uh, you know, adores seeing you in there uh, and, and you're always great, along with Matthew, you know, first to arrive and uh, last to leave kind of thing. So I'm looking forward to getting back to that over over the next year or so. But I'm going to take you now to um, 2012 and the London Olympics, which, of course, were really super special for us um, as a nation. Um, and there was this huge sense of pride, I think, among uh, the general public. What, what was that time like for you as a Team GB athlete? And, you know, it was going to be hosted in your home country. Yeah, it was just unlike anything else. I mean, I'd experienced a bit of that with obviously Beijing, but this was just on a whole other level when it's a home Olympics. It's just, oh, oh baby coffin. Um, yeah, it's a whole, it was a whole other thing. It was kind of like it, people that weren't even interested in sport knew who you were because it was, it was happening here. And it was kind of like amazing to see athletes on magazines, on um, big motorway signs as you walk past or billboards whatever you call them and it was just amazing how much kind of we celebrated athletes during that time um, it was a lot more expectation and pressure that's for sure I, but I think I twisted that into my own way I think when I'd meet so if I was in the supermarket someone would come up to me and was like you're going to win two gold medals again and that was just them wishing me good luck they didn't mean you best do it or else they were just wishing me good luck and obviously people don't know about swimming and I think I took that on how I twisted that was oh gosh I'm gonna let them down if I don't and I kind of created this my own pressure um in a way whereas it kind of wasn't that but I just felt there was a lot more expectation there was a lot more things to to kind of deal with um and I knew I wasn't gonna have the same result I knew I was four years older. I couldn't do the same work that I was able to do four years ago. I had shoulder injuries. I was dealing with so much external stuff, but I also couldn't come out and say that. I couldn't come out and go, guys, I'm not going to win two gold medals because everyone was like, oh, you're just being negative. And it's like, no, I'm being realistic, but people don't know enough about the sport. The 400 and that time between Beijing and, and London was huge in the swimming world. Our biggest ever change in the sport happened between them two Olympics because there was these super shiny suits. We had this suit era. So the whole, um, it changed from these super shiny things that people were wearing and 300 world records going in one year to all of a sudden being 100% textile. They changed the rules on what we could wear. It was a whole massive shift. Um, and I was just kind of in that era as well. So I knew for the 400, there was just no chance. I couldn't do the same speed as the other girls. It had really um, changed the event. The event had actually become more sprinty than it had distance. And I just didn't, I don't have any natural speed. If you knew me, you, I cannot, nothing is speedy about me. And that really changed that event. So to get a bronze in, the, in that was just unbelievable. I was so proud. I mean, I'd only just scraped into the final eighth. So to go from eighth, to then third and getting a bronze was just I was just blown away um it was a little bit different in the 800 because I was ready for that event and yet I just 
dived in and I had nothing to give. I literally had just got my taper wrong. I had got the season wrong and I just could not move. I was like, I feel like I'm swimming through treacle and I couldn't do anything about it because I just physically couldn't go any faster. But I think I learned more about myself in that race than I did at any other race I've ever swam in because I could have easily just backed off one percent and it just not as hurt as much but even though it was so painful I just was like I'm not backing down I'm not giving up and I kind of through absolute sheer pain I just managed somehow to get my hands on that wall and get that bronze medal so it was just I learned how strong I was that day and that I wasn't going to back down from a fight I thought I was a bit weaker and I kind of proved myself a bit wrong in that event, which I was really, really proud of. And again, to then stand on the podium at a home Olympics and have 17,000 people chanting Becky was just unbelievable. I couldn't stop crying. I was like, guys, you're not helping me. I'm crying even more because I just, the whole emotion of the past four years came out and I just felt like I'd let people down. I felt like responsible and I, I felt that, I shouldn't be getting this chance in the girl, Katie, who won, should have got that. So it was just, but that's what makes a home Olympics so special is that home crowd. And it was just one of those that I'll never, ever forget it. And yes, it probably wasn't the results that I wanted, but I'm so proud of my bronze medals and I'm, I take them everywhere. If I go somewhere and I have to take my medals, I will never leave the bronze behind because I'm equally proud of those bronze medals. And I will always class myself as full-time Olympic medalist, not just double Olympic champion, as I'm definitely proud, just as proud of the bronze as I am of the, the golds. Well, hundred a hundred percent agree agree with you, and I, I know we've talked about talked about this over the years. You know, the the bottom line is, you know, you brought two more medals home for Team GB, um, and it made you, I think, our most successful female swimmer ever. Um, you know, I, I think that's huge to be proud of. I, I know at the offices we uh, we paused all work when you were swimming, and we had you up on the big screen, and we were all cheering you on. Um, and it was fantastic, you know, to see you win those uh, those medals. And as you say, it, it, you know, in your home country as well. Um, you retired from the pool uh, after the London Olympics. Um, but when you began your career, did you ever think that you'd retire with these four Olympic medals and, and that you would complete the set with goals in the European Commonwealth and World Championships? Honestly, if somebody had told me that when I was growing up, I think I would have literally fell up, fallen off my chair and just laughed. I would be like, no chance. I literally just thought if I could possibly even just go to an Olympics, let alone go into Europeans, Commonwealth, Worlds, winning golds at all of them, going to Olympics and getting four medals. I literally, I never, ever expected that. It was just my hobby. I think that's the thing. Whenever you start something, it's because you enjoy it. It's because you like it. And I just thought it's just my hobby. It's just my passion. It's just what I do for fun. And I've never kind of seen it as a job. So to kind of have that result is just absolutely mental. And to happen to just me, I'm like, I don't get it. Like you look at Michael Phelps and he's got this ridiculous wingspan and everyone wants to say like, oh, Ian Thorpe's got size 17 feet or like there's something about everyone, isn't there? And I'm just like, there is nothing special about me. Like absolutely zero, nothing. I'm like, I'm just this girl from Mansfield that's probably slightly too chubby, but I just worked hard. And I think that that's what I try and get across so much because it doesn't matter who you are. If you work hard at something, you don't have to be extra special or extraordinary. You can still achieve something that you want to achieve just by sheer hard work. Um, and that's exactly what I did. I never, ever shied away from the hard work. I, I loved it. I loved the training more than I loved the racing, to be honest. I loved pushing my body to the limit. Um, and I just think I'm so grateful that it all paid off um, and just that, I was able to kind of walk away from a career with my head held high. Um, I didn't certainly expect to be retiring at 23, but I'd achieved everything I wanted to. My body was just shutting down. I was just like, I cannot keep doing this. Um, my body was just in bits. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah. I think, as you said earlier on, I, I don't think people realise the toll that the extreme training that you have to do to be an Olympian takes on, on your body, um, you know, but you, you are special um, and you're certainly special to us. Um, Thank you. 
just looking to the future then, what, what does the future look like for Becky Adlington now? Yeah, um, managing kids <laughs> um, and everything else. I run my own loan to some business. So I'm still, people always say to me, what do you do now? Do you coach? Do you do this? And I don't coach anything elite. I don't have patience for that. I think I'd just yell at them. What are you doing? Come on. Whereas I love the learn to swim stuff. I want to make a difference. We have too many kids leaving primary school, unable to swim in this country. It's literally fit over 50% can't swim in this country, which is mad when we live on a small island and it's a life skill. So I'll continue to want to make a difference in just teaching kids a life skill and confidence. It's nothing about going to the Olympics. Obviously, if you do, great. Um, and then obviously continue with commentating on kind of the uh, more elite side of it, as I absolutely love that. I feel very, very grateful um, to have that opportunity. Um, and just, yeah, who knows? I kind of like the fact that anything else might happen, but who knows? Sounds exciting. For anybody that's watching that is interested in, you know, I, I agree with you. I think um, swimming is such an important skill. Um, but for anybody that's watching, um, they can Google Becky Adlington Swim Stars, I think, to uh, yeah. enroll their children. Um, yeah. yeah. But even if somebody wants to be a swim teacher as well, I think that's a it's a really great career. Honestly, it's so rewarding. So it's amazing that we train our own teachers as well with Becky Adlington Training. So we have our training company and that's to train. That's to be a swim teacher anywhere. That's not just with our company. We'll just train you to teach people obviously this amazing life skill and obviously then you could take your kids if if a venue is near you but I just want to promote some in even if you just take your kids to the local baths and take them please please do as it's such an important life skill and it's just one of those that you'll always need it at some point in your life you will need it whether it's on holiday whether you've been out walking in lockdown and you live near a river lake and at whatever it is I think you need this life skill so please do take your kids swimming. Hmm. Well, look, I've taken up um, a lot of your time, something that I think is very limited um, as a new mum. Is there anything else that you'd like to say before we bring the podcast to a close? Um, no, just thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to kind of coming back to events, like you said, hopefully they'll start happening and kind of being able to be out and about a lot more and um, yeah, hopefully get back to just seeing people at the amazing your events are amazing you know how fab they are whether it's art shows cooking ones cookery books have been to all sorts haven't they they're, they're fab yeah um they are and i'm like you really looking forward to getting back to them and i think you you saw on uh, twitter over the weekend that matthews managed yes. to get us to be the the charity for the twitter art exhibit uh, going forward so um so that's going to be happening next year um I, i'm sure that i know matthew and i'd love it if you came along to that that's going to be in your as long as i don't have to do art because i'm terrible but no I'm happily, art required happily come along you've <laughs> just got to come, come along and, and and be gorgeous so there's so there are good things on on the horizon and and just found out that we're, we're we've been shortlisted for a couple more awards for um campaign i think uh campaigning team of the year and, and digital innovation over the pandemic year because obviously we had to try and still deliver all of our services um you know to to people uh, affected by the condition but doing it digitally so so the team have got some things to look forward to so we we're going to see you guys again soon um We've covered an awful lot. We're deeply grateful to you for taking uh, the time to chat with us today, Becky. For those people um, that, that are watching this or listening to this, our services at the Encephalitis Society remain unaffected. So if you need any support or information at all, um, the team remains at your service. You can go to encephalitis.info uh, for contact details or to chat online. And as always, if you can support our work at this very challenging time, please do visit encephalitis.info forward slash donate. Most of all, folks, uh, keep washing your hands, stay safe, get vaccinated, please, and settle down and enjoy the Tokyo Olympics and uh, Team GB in the swimming. <laughs> Take care, everybody.